PSEPR, remember that in that we're talking about what color? We'll go purple. And it won. So VSEPR. That is the ABN designation. Okay? So A is the central atom. So you're really just looking to see, okay, which is the atoms that has the most bonds, because that's the one you're really talking about. So the central atom in the molecule. B is how many groups are bonded to it. Doesn't matter if you're talking about one single bond, if you're talking about a double bond, a triple bond, every bond is just one group. So these are groups bonded. And then N are non-bonding electrons. And these are electron pairs, so you count by twos. Okay, so in the first one, NH3, so central atom is nitrogen. Mm -hmm. So nitrogen is the A. How many groups connected? Three. So it's AB3. And then how many non-bonding pairs? One. So it'd be AB3N. Okay. If you see AB3N, it's always pyramidal. Remember, this is the one I showed you last time, like the little light blue atom that was slightly elevated, had that paddle, the pink paddle sticking up, creating that kind of low pyramid shape. Okay, let's do the next one. We'll come back and do the polar nonpolar afterwards. So let's do the next one. So what's the central atom in that one? The one to the right. Mm -hmm. So carbon is going to be the central atom. Because it has the most, it's kind of the one in the middle, has the most bonds, groups connected. How many groups? Three. How many non-bonding pairs? None. So this one is AB3. Do you see the difference between NH3 and CH2O? Do you see how nitrogen has that non-bonding pair? Oxygen, I put too many, put too many dots, sorry. I got a little overzealous with my dots. Those, these should not be dots. <laughs> okay, oxygen has non-bonding pairs, but they're not connected to the carbon. So when it asks about the N, that is non-bonding pairs on the central atom only. So it doesn't matter if any of the adjacent atoms are. So do you see how that carbon has three groups connected? It has two hydrogens and one oxygen. Even though one is a double bond, that's still just one group of electrons connected to the oxygen. So that would be AB3N, and that always forms a really flat triangular shape. They call that mm -hmm, trigonal planar. Looks like a triangle, and it's flat, because that's 120 degrees between each of the groups sticking off. HCN, hydrogen cyanide. So this one central atom would be Carbon, mm -hmm. so carbon is our A. How many groups connected? Two. two. AB2, does carbon have any non-bonding pairs? No, never does, okay? So it's just AB2. So what's the shape that this will always take? Linear, mm -hmm. because, so the hydrogen and the nitrogen get as far apart from each other as possible and that should actually have an extra line. I don't want to have, I put a triple bond on there. I swear, it should be a triple, sorry. Okay, AB2N, A, sorry, AB2, and that would make a linear molecule. Last one, so last one, CH2, or sorry, CHCl3, which the central atom is, carbon, and it's A. How many groups? Four. Four, one up, one down, one left, one right. And no lone pairs, no non-bonding electrons. So just AB4. And anytime you have AB4, it is tetrahedral. Just remember that there's a chart that you can use. For the most part, these are the ones you're like you're we're gonna stick to. If you see carbon with four single bonds, always a tetrahedral. Okay? Nitrogen with three single bonds, always gonna be pyramidal because it's always got those non-bonding pairs. So we got the form. The form is the ABN type. The shape is based on that form. Now the last one, polar or nonpolar. So remember, what are the four atoms you look for? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Remember on the periodic table, the small nonmetals, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and chlorine, they're the ones, they're small up in the upper right-hand corner. 
These are the ones that do not share electrons very evenly. So if they form a bond with a hydrogen, if they form a, bar, a bond with a carbon, they're not going to share evenly. They're going to pull electrons. So when you look at the first one, where will the electrons spend more time? Around the nitrogen. So that means that the electrons will all get pulled more towards that nitrogen. So you'll see that arrow with like, it kind of looks like it has a slash through it. That's just saying electrons get pulled towards the electronegative. So this side becomes what? Slightly, slightly, that side becomes slightly negative around the nitrogen. And remember it's pyramidal, it's not truly flat. It has that little bit of a pyramid shape. So the top part becomes more negative. And then down here, more positive. Around those hydrogens, more positive. So if we have this slight positive and negative, what do we have? Polar. Polar. If you have electronegatives, they don't share the electrons very evenly, you end up with a polar molecule. So what about the one straight across to the right? It is because there is one oxygen. So which way do the electrons get pulled more? Pulled down towards that oxygen. So that double bond is not evenly shared between the carbon and the oxygen. The electrons get pulled down towards the electronegative. That side then becomes more positive. That side becomes more negative. Creating a polar molecule. HCN, so you just look, and remember I told you, if you have one nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, or chlorine, then it's almost always polar, okay? If it's little and there's just one, then that's always going to create this like slight imbalance. Which way will the electrons get pulled? Towards the right, towards that nitrogen. They're going to end up hanging out with the nitrogen more than the carbon. That's going to create a more negative side. That's the negative. This side becomes slightly positive, and you end up with a polar molecule. So the last one, CHCl3. So you see the chlorine. So th with this bond, which way do the electrons go? Towards the chlorine. So they're going to say they get pulled towards the chlorine. What about the one on the right? Mm -hmm. towards the chlorine and then the one at the bottom towards the chlorine but now this is where shape helps you to see that so remember when thinking about the tetrahedral they're like up and then there's the three that are split so think like the three bottom ones are the chlorine that hydrogen could be up at the top that bottom area will all become more negative so this side will become more negative the side where the hydrogen is will become more positive. So do you see in that one, like you could think like there's more chlorines on one side of the molecule. You could kind of split it and say there's chlorines on one side compared to the other side to create a polar molecule. So I didn't do this on purpose, but all of them are polar. So one that might be a little different is if we did another linear molecule like carbon dioxide. So notice in that one, with carbon dioxide, it's linear. So you have oxygens on opposite sides. The electrons would get pulled. In this one, they would go this way, but then they'd also go that way. So what is that going to do to, it's going to balance it. And that's why carbon dioxide is nonpolar. So in that one, we have two electronegatives, two oxygens, but they balance themselves. So they are found on opposite sides, creating this nonpolar. So this one's polar, HCN, this one's polar. Now if I had carbon tetrachloride, so can you see in that, here let me sh shorten it. So can you see in that one, like the chlorines would be all around that carbon? So they would pull, the electrons get pulled this way, they get pulled that way, this way, and that. But 
they end up balancing them. I can't separate that and make half of the molecule more negative and half more positive. So they're evenly arranged. That's a nonpolar molecule. There's not a lot of examples of those, but if you have electronegative atoms, it's helpful in knowing the shape so you can kind of compare where are the electronegatives. Do they balance each other or are they all on one side? Okay, so now the other thing that I worked on is I was like, here, here, they're really like this. Maybe not, but I tried. So this actually puts like naming moles and grams, molecules, puts all of this together in practicing. So remember that we said you can go from grams to moles and moles to grams. The only thing that you need to know is... The formula mass. So remember that the formula mass is how many grams in one mole based on the formula. So if we have Na2SO4 to figure out the formula mass, you need to add up the mass of each of the elements found in the formula. So if we have Na2SO4, so I have two sodiums, and each sodium weighs, and I told you with this, just take the number of the atomic mass on the periodic table and round to a whole number. So Na, we would say 23. Multiply it times 2 because there's 2 in the formula. So that's 46. Sulfur, 32. And there's only one of them. But then oxygen is 16, and there are four of them. Mm -hmm. Yep, so 16 times 4 is 64. So the formula mass is the mass of each of the elements in the formula added together. So I got 142. And that's grams per mole. So that is telling you how many grams in one mole? Can you see it still? Can you go over there. There. Okay. So if you see grams in moles, you need to know the formula mass. But then it's just one step. So if I want to know how many grams in two and a half, I know how many is in one. So 2.50 moles times what unit do you put on the bottom? Moles. Mm hmm. So in that formula mass, grams goes on the top. We said 142 out of 1. Anybody need a calculator? I have it. I brought the box. Feel free to come up and grab a calculator. So multiply everything across the top. So 142 times two and a half. Three hundred and fifty five grams. Yes? Do you have to round? No, because two point five zero, three significant figures, so you would keep everything. I tried to put the right number of significant figures in this one. So now here's the second fabulous one. So what's its name? Sodium sulfate. Mm -hmm. Remember the SO4. Remember that this is a polyatomic. So if you miss that one, that's a polyatomic. Go back and make that list. So I will give you your card tonight. You can write anything you want on this card for the exam. Okay, so if SO4, 2 minus, and sulfate is difficult to remember, put those on there. Okay, hopefully you've been kind of making a list of things that you think you need to put on your card. So that would be one. So the name, remember, it's a ionic compound. Sodium is the metal. You just use the whole name of the first element, and then you use the name of 
the polyatomic. So this one is sodium sulfate. So how many moles in 175 grams of dinitrogen trioxide? Let's do the formula first because that will help. Dinitrogen trioxide is? And 2O3. Dinitrogen, two nitrogens. Trioxide, three oxygens. So for N2O3, two nitrogens. Each nitrogen weighs? 14. And I have two of them, so that's 28. And then I have oxygen weighs 16, and there's three of them. 48. 28 plus 48, so remember that you've got to add the two. So 76 grams per mole. So if you have moles and you have grams, you're going to have to figure out the formula mass. So 175 grams times in the line. What unit do you put on the bottom? Grams. The unit that you're starting. These are only one step conversions, so they're super easy. Just make sure that you put the unit on the bottom that you start with so that you know you'll cancel it. And then that way the other unit goes on the top. So if you're starting with grams, grams goes on the bottom, moles on top. If you're starting with moles, moles goes on the bottom, so grams will go on top. So whichever way you have to put that formula mass down, we know in one mole there's 76 grams. Grams and grams will cancel. 175 divided by 76. I got 2.30263157 moles. What do you need to do? Mm -hmm. Can you keep all that? No. no, that's a super exact number. Way too many significant figures. So you look at your measured number. How many significant figures? Three. Okay. So here is one, two, three. Okay. So the first three significant figures, I have to look at the next number. The next number is a two. So what happens to all the rest of them? They just drop off. Right? So I'm going to go, I'm going to have to keep the 2.30, the next numbers are 2, so those just get dropped. So this would be 2.30 moles. Don't drop that 0, because that 0 is still considered a significant figure because of our measured number in the problem. Uh-huh. Oh, geez. That's molecules. <laughs> Change that. Because that would be a whole lot of molecules if we went to that many moles. All right. How many molecules in 1.65 moles of iron 2 chloride? If you see moles and molecules, you don't have to calculate the formula mass. You just have to know what? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You just have to remember how to put this in your calculator. So definitely, may, if you don't remember that one, you need to put that one on your card, okay? 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules is one mole of anything. Doesn't matter if we're talking about sodium sulfate or dinitrogen trioxide or if we're talking about iron 3 chloride. So this is always just a single unit conversion, but you do need to make sure that you can put it in your calculator correctly. So 1.65 moles. Times in the line, what unit on the bottom? Mm -hmm. So moles will go on the bottom and molecules on top. And we said, according to Avogadro's number, there's one mole has 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Okay, so Avogadro's number for the mole is the conversion. So now here's the fun part. If you have a graphing calculator, I suggest that when you put 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, put a bracket around it. If you don't have a graphing calculator, if you're the old school calculator, you can put it in as long as you use the EE. So just use 1.65 times 6.02 EE 23. That automatically puts that scientific notation number in as an exponent. Anybody not get 
I got 9.933 times 10 to the 23rd. And that would be moles. Molecules. Mm -hmm. So let me show you. So I put the number, so it's 1.65 times, so it's you're multiplying everything across the top. So for you, 6.03 times 10 to the 23rd times 1.65. You see how you got 9.933 times 10 to the 23rd? So E23, but make sure you do that with the bracket. You got like a bracket calculator. You have, have you ever used your button? Yes. Uh huh. Uh, but, but, well, wait, put this in. So put in 1.65. Hear that? Yeah, 1.65. Times and then put 6.02 and then EE and then 23. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to put that in after the EE. Oh, no, 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 no. See how it looks on the old calculator? See the exponent comes up like smaller and an elevated? And E3. Yep. Yep. You see, you have 9.933 times 10 to the 23rd. So what you see on yours looks just is actually this. So the little 23 means times 10 to the 23rd. So can I keep all those? No. No. How many significant figures? Three. 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 Uh huh. So I'm going to have to do what? So it will be what? 9.93. Yep. Okay. So since 1.65, that's my significant figures, I'm going to keep the 9.93, but that last three, I'm going to round off. Uh huh. Where? Which one? The, the third one. So you can only have How many moles in 175 grams? Yes. So okay. Because we found oh, you're saying, so we, 76 is not a measured number. 76 is a number off the periodic table. Same thing with Avogadro's. Avogadro's number, if we, we don't use that, that's not a number we measured. So 2.5 moles, 175 grams, 1.65 moles, those are considered measured numbers because those would be numbers we would be getting, okay? And that's what you use in trying to figure out rounding. So someone asked like, why don't I take Avogadro's number into account when rounding? You, anything that's like a standard number, you don't use that. You only use rounding comes into play when you're talking about measured numbers. That's why if you convert, unit convert, you don't round those numbers, right? If we go from 125 milligrams to 0.125 grams, you don't round those numbers because the unit conversion, it doesn't come into play in rounding, okay? So it's the same thing with these ones. So always just look back at the number. So here's the challenge. What is the formula of iron three chloride? <laughs> okay, so what's iron? Iron is Fe. And chlorine is Cl. Okay, so what's the Roman numeral three mean? Uh huh. It tells you the charge on the iron. What's the charge on a chlorine? It's over in group seven. So it's going to be a minus one. And so how do you figure out the, then you gotta take those charges and swap them. Mm -hmm. So FeCl3. The charge on the iron tells you the number of chlorine. The charge on the chlorine tells you the number of iron. That's why I was trying to go back to review some of those, just to like jar you, I guess. <laughs> Hopefully your memory, not just you. <laughs> so how many moles are in 2.75 times 10 to the 10th molecules, thank you, of CBr4? If you see moles and molecules, just use this. You don't have to do really, just have to set it up. 
If you see moles and molecules, just go to Avogadro's number. So 2.75 times 10 to the 10th molecules, sorry, that's an error, times in a line. What unit goes on the bottom? Molecules, unit you start with goes on the bottom. Moles on top. One mole is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Now the challenge here is you have two exponent values. If you have a graphing calculator, do make sure you bracket those because if you put them in straight, it will take 10 to the 10th and divide it by 6.02. And then it'll multiply it times 10 to the 23rd. So when you put it in, put brackets. If you have an old school calculator, as long as you use the EE button, you don't have to do that. So when I'm going to put this in, I'm going to put 2.75 EE. 10. Then I'm going to hit divided by 6.02 EE23. Okay? If you have a graphing calculator, put use your brackets or parentheses is what they call them to make sure that you parentheses this number and parentheses that number. You're dividing the top number by the bottom. So I got Mm -hmm. 4.568106312 times 10 to the minus 14th. Did everybody get that? Okay. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you cross out the word moles? Because that's an error. Because look, it's moles and moles. That was a typo. Yeah, change that and just put molecules. That's my mistake. I, didn't look. I, I thought I went back and double checked them all. I was just trying to make one that would be like a practice in naming and also a practice in doing these ones too, but I, I goofed on that one. Okay, so my answer is moles. Can I keep all that? No. no. How many? Three. 2.75. So I can keep three significant figures. That's what's in 2.75. So I would keep the 4.56. The next is an 8, so that's going to make it round up. Mm -hmm. So I'd have 4.57. Do keep the exponent. When I say you drop, you can't drop the exponent numbers. So you would just drop the, the unit value in front. So it would be 4.57 times 10 to the minus 14th moles. Okay? Mm -hmm. So you, did you put 2.75? Time EE10, and then divided by 6.02 EE23. Do you see a little number up in the upper right corner at the very end? That's the exponent value. So do you see that it says minus 14? My mom says what? I think it's the equal button. I don't That means 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Oh, okay. Okay, that's all you got to do. Put yourself a note for that. So, like, if you're going to use this on the test, like, you don't have to put times 10 to the EE. Okay? You just put EE because it means times 10 to the. Okay? So, it sort of like shortens actually what you have to put in. So, then the last one, what's the name of CBR4? If you use that, put parentheses. If you can do that, if you have a graphing calculator, you can do that. Just make sure you put parentheses around your exponents. Okay? So CBR4 is? Yeah, carbon tetrabromide. All right. So practice those. Really work on all the Chapter 3 stuff, like do the... Covalent compounds, if you haven't done it, do the, the moles. There's also the electronegativity. And then just work on that post-lecture homework three. 
I will save that and keep it po and post it too. So I'll post it again as another little worksheet review so you can go back and look at it if you need to. So chapter four is really our organic compound introduction. So remember that we said, and we'll look at those, that when you're looking at covalent molecules, CHON, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, that those are really the big ones. And look at the vast majority of the elements that you find in organic molecules. And in fact, by definition, an organic molecule is a molecule that contains carbon. So these can have carbon with hydrogen, carbon with hydrogen and oxygen, carbon with hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. In this chapter, we're going to talk about the simplest of the organic molecules, and they call them hydrocarbons. So it's not, this isn't all of your organic molecules, because we're going to do carbohydrates, we'll talk about lipids, we're going to talk about um, proteins, which are all organic molecules. But in this chapter, we're really going to focus more on the hydrocarbons, and their name tells you what they have in them. So hydrocarbons are made of two things. What? Hydrogen and carbon. If you have just hydrogen and carbon, you don't have nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and chlorine. So that means that the covalent bonds are evenly distributed, that they're evenly shared, and you're talking about nonpolar molecules. So hydrocarbons, molecules of mostly carbon and hydrogen, nonpolar, and you know now that things that are nonpolar do not mix with the watery polar molecules. They separate out. So here's your examples, ones that we talked about before. Examples, fuels, greases, oils, lubricants, waxes. In the body, we have lipids. So lipids are very useful because lipids are also primarily hydrocarbon. They don't mix with water, but they make great membranes. They make great barriers to help compartmentalize parts of your cell, to help separate fluid regions, because water doesn't mix with them, so they form a wall. So we'll talk about the cell membrane, talk about structures of the cell membrane, and even the steroids, cholesterol, and such, and their relationship to the hydrocarbons. We learned in lab <laughs> that when we burn hydrocarbons, they re are very exothermic. So that means that they release a lot of heat. Mm -hmm. So even when we burn the nut, because the nut had the oil, which is a type of lipid, nut oils like almonds, cashews, we did the pecans, all of those, lots of heat generated that we measured as a means of trying to determine calorie content, energy within those foods. But this is why we use hydrocarbons as fuels, okay? So like I have a gas pack furnace. So I have a gas line through the city that's plumbed to or piped into my exterior furnace that ignites, so the gas flows through it, ignites, combines with oxygen, and in doing so generates lots of heat that then a blower just blows into the house. I lived in Maine for eight years and we had oil furnaces. And so we had these big, huge, those like huge cows down in the basement, and they would come in like pump 250 gallons of oil into the oil tank down in the basement. You could put it outside because it would freeze. So you'd put it in the basement, and then that's what we actually had an oil furnace compared to a gas pack furnace. So various hydrocarbons in their structure and then their naming, you just follow the same basic patterns in all of them. We're going to talk about a different kinds of ways that you can write their formulas, different ways you can draw them, and naming. So in this, the simplest of the hydrocarbons are called alkanes, and the term on the end, the A-N-E, means all single bonds. Uh-huh, A-N-E on the ending. So if you have a single carbon, all single bonds, remember that carbon has to have four covalent bonds. So that 
has the base name called meth. Not like the drug. This was around a whole lot long, a whole lot before the drug came out, because those are methamphetamines. Okay? But if you're talking about meth, that refers to a single carbon. So meth, with all single bonds, is called methane. And in fact, that's what natural gas is. It's CH4. It is methane. So we could draw it. And then this, the molecular formula and the condensed formula, they're exactly the same. There's no difference to them. If I was going to draw the Lewis structure, I would draw the carbon with four single bonds, hydrogen on each one. A two-carbon molecule, C2H6, you would put the two carbons side by side and link them. And then notice if we have all single bonds, do you see that each of those carbons has three that it needs to have paired? There's a hydrogen on each one. So can you see how that's C2H6? So when you have a two carbon group, they call that eth. So meth was a single carbon, eth is a double is two carbons, and since they're all single, they call it ethane. Now the condensed structure tells you what's around each carbon. And in some ways, the condensed structure is a little bit easier, especially when you start talking about bigger ones. So the condensed structure, I would say that I have a carbon with three hydrogens, so I would have CH3 connected to a carbon with three hydrogens. So do you see how this structure sort of shows you how it's arranged? There's a carbon with three hydrogens connected to a carbon with three hydrogens. They call that the condensed formula, different from the molecular. So when I look at the molecular, it doesn't give me any idea how it's arranged, but the condensed kind of gives you some idea of how many hydrogens around each carbon. Mm -hmm. How on earth would you know? Why not the C connected to C and the H3? So how many bonds you know that hydrogen only ever forms one covalent bond? Okay. And so if you have C2H6, you would connect the two carbons because you would connect the two they need the most bonds. And that would leave three empty spots around each carbon. So you would put three hydrogens on each side. So that would be C2H6. Two carbons, six hydrogens. So you can see it in the Lewis structure and then you can see it in that one the CH3, CH3. Let's do a couple more, and I think that you'll see them kind of like starting to show. If you have three carbons, they are all going to be in a row, okay? They have to be because they all, all the hydrogens only need one bond. So they can't be in the middle. They're only ever going to be on the outside. So in this, you would have, I'll change color so you can see it maybe. So you would have carbon to carbon to carbon, if these are all single bonds, each carbon is going to have four covalent bonds. Carbon to carbon to carbon. Do you see that there's like three spots above, three below, two on either side? So that would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that would be C3H8. When you have a three carbon group, they call it a prop. This is propane. So if you've ever cooked with like the, with gas, like if you have a gas grill, then you have a 20 pound propane tank, okay? If you've ever had like the little hibachi travel grill, you get those little green cylinders, that is liquefied propane. So it's propane that's pressurized to form a liquid so that it doesn't take up so much space. And it's a really good fuel for running those grills. So if I was going to draw the condensed structural formula, I would indicate each carbon and how many hydrogens around them. So the one on the left would be CH3. The middle one would be CH2. And then CH3 on the end. So the condensed formula just gives you an idea about how many hydrogens are around each carbon.
four, four carbons. They're all going to be in a chain. We're just going to do them all as straight chains. Four carbons in a row, all connected by single bonds. That's always going to leave a, a, a line above, a line below, and then one on either end. And if you count, there should be ten, room for 10 hydrogens. Four carbons in a row is called butane. And the condensed structural formula would have each carbon and how many hydrogens are connected. So the outside would be? Mm -hmm. Then? Two. Then? Mm -hmm. And the last one? Mm -hmm. And it would just continue to repeat. So we can go bigger and bigger and bigger with each one. Five carbons in a row, they call that pentane. Just like a pentagon. Okay, so that one starts getting six. Again, what's a six-sided figure? Hex. Mm -hmm. This is hexane. Seven, seven-sided figure. Heptane. Eight is octane. Nine gets to be no name. We don't do those ones very much, but then we'll go to the last one. Ten is decane. So in each one, I would really just increase by one carbon. It would increase my number of hydrogens by two. You're always going to have a hydrogen above, below, and then one on either end if you're talking about a straight chain. The outside edges are always like CH3s. The inside ones are always going to be the CH2s. So they give you the chart, and that's like as much as what we would end up doing. But those meth, eth, prop, and but are ones that to learn. Because those ones don't match. They're not like mono, di, tet, and tri, and tetra. So those ones are kind of weird. Meth is one carbon. Eth is two carbons. Prop is three. But is four. But from that point forward, it really follows normal geometry. Right? Pent sounds like five, hept is seven, hex is six, oct is eight, just like any other sided figures. So those ones are always more familiar, but it's those first four that are just kind of weird. So meth is one carbon, eth is two carbons, prop is three carbons, bute is four. And butane, if you ever had a big lighter, that is pressurized butane. So they take the gas and they pump it into the big lighter so that it becomes a liquid. When you press the button, you release the pressure and the liquid converts to a gas. So you run and create a spark and all these fuels all will burn. So that's what creates the flame. So if I was gonna do octane, what would be the condensed structural formula for octane? CH3. How many of those? Mm -hmm. Yep, so you'd end up with six CH2s, and then on either end, a CH3. Sometimes they'll condense this because it's so darn long, and they'll say CH3 parentheses CH2 6. So do you see that? It just means that there's all those CH3s in a row. So there's a whole bunch repeating. So you, if you see that, that's all that's telling you. But notice all of these single bonds. We're not going to name double bonds or triple bonds. So those are just different ways that you can see them. The condensed structural formula is kind of nice because it tells you what's around each carbon. So it helps you kind of, if you had to go and expand and draw that out, not too bad. So these are all the straight chains. But believe it or not, single-bonded single carbon structures can form rings. One of the fancy things that carbon can do, because carbon has 
this ability to form four bonds so we can make ring structures. Rings of five and six are the most common ring structures that you'll see in nature. Not that one, where are you? There. So they show in this, here is cyclopropane, not very common. But can you see that that cyclopropane has three carbons? Three carbons total. Cyclo means ring. If you see the word cyclo, then you know it's a ring of whatever comes next. So cyclopropane, ring of three. Doesn't really exist in nature. Super reactive because those, can you see those carbons don't really like being bonded like that. It's a little tight. Second one, cyclobutane means ring of four. Also, not all that common because carbon would rather be at 109.5 degrees. And so that puts it at like 90 so that kind of forces those bonds too close, not very stable. But the word cyclo, ring, butane, four carbons. So you would have four carbons in a ring. These two, much more common, okay? Cyclopentane, a ring of five. So can you count one, two, three, four, five carbons? They use the balls and sticks, which we're gonna use in lab on Wednesday. The balls and sticks, the little black balls would be carbon. The little white ones are all the hydrogens, like what we did in lab in class. We were playing with just small ones. Cyclopentane, ring of five carbons. Cyclohexane, ring of six. So these ones, the more common ones that you're gonna see in nature, We're gonna talk about carbohydrates, which, which form ring structures, ring structures of carbon. So if you see this, we call it cyclopentane. So now notice all of those H's, they get to be quite the pain, especially when you're drawing them and you're like, H's and H's and H's and H's all over the place. So there is one other way that they draw them, and that is like this. Skeletal structures don't show any hydrogens. They're there, but they leave them off because it makes it super fast to draw long chains of carbons if you can just do zigzags. So in this first one, so, C8, so C3H8, this is propane. All of these are just different ways that you could actually illustrate propane. The first one, that's the condent, is the molecular. So notice that molecular doesn't tell you anything about the bonding arrangements. It just tells you there's three carbons and eight hydrogens, okay? So molecular is kind of like H2O. So it's just the formula, nothing about how it's arranged. The condensed structure though, tells you how many, what is around each carbon. My personal favorite, just because when I look at that, I go, that's a carbon with three hydrogens connected to a carbon with two hydrogens connected to a carbon with three hydrogens. So it just gives you more information about the bonding arrangement. The Lewis structure is when you write everything out. And that's where you gotta put all the H's, okay? So you'll always have H's above and below and on the left and on the right for the straight chain. Mm -hmm. If I was gonna do this, it seems to me it makes it easier to go from CPHA to the Lewis structure. But you still have to like kind of count them. When you look at condensed, can you see that this means there's a carbon with three hydrogens connected to a carbon with two hydrogens connected to a carbon with three? Yes. Mm -hmm. So molecular is just going to shrink it to make it take up as little room as possible. But then they came up with the next one. So the next one, it looks kind of goofy because it looks like a teepee, <laughs> okay? It doesn't look like much. It's called the skeletal structure, and it really becomes useful when you start talking about six, seven, eight, nine, ten carbons in a chain. Because instead of going CH2, CH2, CH2 and writing them all out, you can do a zigzag. With that, every corner and every bend is a carbon, okay? Every corner every end is a carbon. It does not illustrate the hydrogens, but they are there. So you can't like go, I don't know. <laughs> if you see that middle carbon, you know that that middle carbon has to have two H's 
because carbon has to have four bonds. Okay, so you would uh, you would assume there's hydrogens there creating the stable octets, creating four bonds. The end carbons would have three hydrogens. The middle carbons would have two. But it shortens this dramatically. So remember when we did um, octane? So the way that you would do the skeletal structure for octane is where you put your pen down, that's carbon one. Every corner is carbons, and at the end, that's eight. So I start here and say one, two, not that. There's, stop. Three, no. It doesn't like it because I pressed too hard on the pen. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that's octane. You can draw that one super fast. And then go back. Whenever I go from trying to draw, I always go back and go, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'll always go back and like count my ends in every corner to make sure that I have the right number. The other way to remember with skeletal, you're always going to have one less line than carbons. Okay, so how many lines for that one? Seven. Seven. Mm -hmm. You'll always have one less line than number of carbons in the formula because you've got a start point and an end point. Okay, so this is C8H18. Notice that there's seven lines. I just count as I put it down. So as soon as I put my pencil down, that's carbon one. And so then each is really representing bonds between carbons in a skeletal structure. So it only shows bonds, no atoms. So these are different ways. We'll really do a lot more, like we'll start off doing some of the Lewis structures and then condensed structures, and then we'll kind of work into skeletal and kind of practice going back and forth with them. So when you go to draw a skeletal structure, like I said, just make sure where you put your pencil down or pen down, that's carbon one, and that each line represents bonds between carbons. You will always have one less line than numbers of carbons in the formula. Sort of like a good rule of thumb to remember. So four carbons, three lines, three carbons, one line. Naming. Sometimes you have a molecule that's not just in a chain. So if it was just eight carbons in a row, you'd just say, well, that's octane, and you just move on. But if you look at this top one, do you notice that there's five carbons in a row, and then there's one carbon hanging off of the second carbon from the left? So that means I have six carbons here, but I can't call that hexane. Hexane would be six carbons in a row. This one's not six carbons in a row, so I have what they call a group hanging off of the chain. I sometimes call them hanging groups. I sometimes call them like non-hydrogen non groups hanging off. And so to properly name this, you run through a couple of steps. And the nice thing is, you always run it exactly the same way. So here's the steps that you do in naming. If you have a carbon-hydrogen molecule, you always do this first. Find the longest carbon chain in the molecule, okay? Because that's going to become kind of like our base name. And then we're just going to add or name anything that's not a hydrogen that hangs off. So in this first one, when I look, I see one, two, three, four, five, okay? So I would say that's the longest carbon chain. It would not be wrong if I went like this, because do you see that that's five, two? I always just try to stick to the straight, just keep it as simple as possible. That wouldn't be wrong. We'll stay with this one because I started the numbering. So it's a five, what is five? Five carbons in a chain is called pentane. Mm -hmm. So the longest carbon chain becomes the end or the very end part of the name. So I know this is something pentane. So see, you can see all those hydrogens sticking off. The only thing you have to name is anything that's not hydrogen. 
So when I look, do you see that this is the group hanging off? It's a carbon hanging off. So that is the only one I have to name. So I told you if you have one carbon, it's a meth. Two carbons is F, three carbons is prop. If it's a group hanging off, you use the number of carbons hanging off and you add YL. So that makes this a meth bowl. So it's a methyl. Find the non-hydrogen groups attached to the chain. That's a methyl. So a group hanging off that looks like this, that's a methyl. It might stick off of the top. It might stick off of the bottom, but it's not part of the chain. It's a methyl group. If I have this, CH2, CH3, that would be what? What's well, a two carbon group? One is meth, two is F. That makes this a ethyl. Mm -hmm. you're, you're all there. So remember going back. So remember I said if you have just one carbon, it's meth. And if it's just one carbon with four hydrogens, methane. But if it's a group hanging off of the chain, I use the first part of the number of carbons, and I add YL. Mm -hmm. Yep, so one carbon. It's not the chain. It's hanging off of the chain. So that's why I would call it methyl. So a CH3, and like I said, this CH3 could be up here. It could be down here. It could be hanging off of any of those spaces instead of a hydrogen, and it's a methyl group. If I had CH2CH3, so if I had a two carbon group hanging off, oh, then it's a ethyl. Well, like if I had a CH2CH3, kind of, yeah, kind of like this one down here. Oh, mm -hmm. Yeah, see how that's a CH2CH3? Yeah. So that would be an ethyl. ethyl. Mm -hmm. So because F means two carbons. Mm -hmm. So first, find the longest carbon chain. I'm going to call it a pentane. Two, find, circle, and name any non-hydrogen groups hanging off. So that's a methyl. The last thing, you have to indicate where the methyl is. So you have to do step three, number the chain so the group hanging off has the lowest possible number. That means that I've got to number my carbon chain. I have to number from left to right, or it could be right to left. But I need to number it so that my methyl has the lowest possible number possible that it could. So this would be one, two, three, four, five. So going from left to right, the red numbers, one, two, three, four, five. Going from right to left, the green numbers, one, two, three, four, five. The methyl, the lowest number would be what? Yeah, using the red. And so that's why I wouldn't use the green ones. I would just use the red numbers that I've got in that chain, and that is why this is 2-methylpentane. Number 2 tells you which carbon in the chain it hangs off of. So I would write it like that, 2-methylpentane. Okay, so now the tricks. One, always find the longest carbon chain and it's not always the one that's straight. So when you look at this one on the bottom, how many do you see in the longest carbon chain? Starting where? Okay, so if I start here, Eight. Do you see any more? Notice if I started from that end, it would only be seven. So if I went straight across, I'd only have seven. So the rule is find the longest carbon chain, and it is not always straight in a row. Okay, so you sometimes you have to go around a corner or something like that. So if it's eight, what's the name of this? It's octane. So that means I've already now accounted for all those carbons. I only have to name the other ones. So what other non-hydrogen groups hanging off do I have? How many of them? There's one here, there's one here, and there's one here. So do you see that I have three? Each one is called a methyl. 
This one's a methyl. CH3s are all methyls. And notice it doesn't matter if they're on top or to the side. They're hanging off of the chain. So they're methyls. So how do I want a number? So I could go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So I could go the blue route and start at the bottom and number up. Or I could go the, well, not that one. I'll go the green route and we'll start up here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. So if I'm doing green, this methyl is a what? Three, and this methyl is a five, and this methyl is a six. So do you see those? So if I went by the green numbering, which meant I started from that far right, I would hit a three methyl, then a five methyl, then a six methyl. What if I started from the other side? What if I went with the blue? This one would be a three, a four, and a six. So which one would I use to give me the lowest number combination? Do I use 3, 5, 6 or 3, 4, 6? 3, 4, 6. Okay? So that means that I want to use the blue. So it's 3, 4, 6. Here's the only part about this naming that I think is ridiculous. If I see 3, 4, 6, there are 3, 4, and 6 what? They're all... Methyls, mm hmm So they're all methyl. That's, that says methyl, sorry. But they require, if there's more than one of the same group, you have to indicate how many. So this would be called a trimethyl. Seems pretty obvious that there's three, because i got three numbers. Like, that works for me. But IUPAC, so the International Union of Physicists and Chemists, are the ones that came up with these naming rules. I didn't make up these rules. <laughs> I just follow the rules. So the rules say if you have more than one group that's the same, you group them together, which is convenient rather than having to say 3-methyl, 4-methyl, 6-methyl. You can say 3, 4, 6-methyl, but they want you to indicate that try to say that there's three of them. So if you had an ethane hanging off of... Like carbon five. three. Uh huh. Okay, yep. Just for mm -hmm. five, just for okay. Five mm -hmm. With two carbons hanging off there, it would still be three, four, six, five methyl, and then five. Nope. And then four. Propane. Are you or gonna? You go three, four, oh, you're going up off of three, six. Yeah. Yeah. And then it'd be six ethyl. Okay. And then the six ethyl would be between the trimethyl and the octane. It'd be like up here. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're naming it. Oh, and the last, so the last rule is, is if you have more than one type of functional group, you list them alphabetically. So I would put ethyl before methyl. Uh -huh. That's, that's, I wasn't going to tell you that yet. I was going to have you get okay with this. <laughs> I was like, these are just methyls. Everybody likes a methyl. <laughs> Wait a minute, I can't hear you. you guys say it one more time. Uh huh. Um, why those the... These ones down here? Yes. Well, they're part of the chain. Yeah. So anything part of the chain, you're not going to name otherwise. Okay? Because really, and we'll look at this in lab, these are bendable. They're not rigid. So these bonds can actually roll and rotate and twist. So like, even though it looks like it goes around a corner, it can twist. Single bonds have free rotation, so I could actually stretch them out and make them look straight. I just drew it this way to try and get you to make sure that you look for the longest carbon chain. Mm -hmm. This here, we have uh, two on the bottom, and then all the ones go to the top and the right. Uh -huh. Is it possible that, uh, so we have straight lines and L's, is it possible there could be a staircase? Chain? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Find the longest carbon chain. So let's do a couple more because I, I have some of those for you. Okay. Okay. So, um, in that case, you wouldn't add the numbers in front of that, just methyl. You'd still use the numbers because you have to indicate which carbons that those methyls are hanging off of. 
So 3, 4, 6 trimethyl octane means it's an octane molecule with methyls on carbon 3, carbon 4, and carbon 6. Uh -huh. But you add the tri in there too, not my rule. That's the one thing that I think is a little redundant. Three numbers and then saying tri at the same time. So the name of that is 3, 4, mm -hmm. 6 trimethyl mm -hmm. That would be the name. Yeah, and this is one that, like I said, it's a practice thing. So let's practice some more. So look at this top one. And so these you've got all of, these are all in your PowerPoint. So hopefully you've got those so you don't have to try and draw them back out again. But in looking at this, first thing, what's the longest carbon chain? The one that looks longest to The one that looks longest is In this case, it is. Uh huh. Okay, so do you see that you could just go straight? Do you see seven? Yes? Mm -hmm. Count the number of carbons across. Like this? Like that? And what is that? So, is that different? Mm -mm. Still the same. What if I went like this? Count those. Uh huh. That's also seven. These bonds are not rigid. So do you see how I'm really just like, I could rotate this to create the straight with these ones hanging off? Just find the longest carbon chain and circle it. So longest carbon chain is seven, so that would be named what? Heptane. Mm -hmm. So there, so once you've named that, you don't have to worry about any of those carbons. All you have to do is look for anything that's hanging off. And I only have two hanging off. I have a CH3, and you know that's a what? That's a methyl. Okay? And I have a CH2CH3. So when you have two carbons coming in one chain off, like one branch, that is a ethyl. So you see the difference between a methyl and an ethyl? So a methyl is a single carbon group hanging off the chain. An ethyl group is a two-carbon group hanging off of the chain. So this is methyl ethyl heptane, or ethyl methyl heptane. But first you've got to give them their numbers. Which side do I start numbering from? Right or left? Why? Because uh -huh. it's closer to the end with a branch. So that's what I do, is I always start from each end and I go in until I find a branch. And then that way, because that'll make it simpler. Do you see if I come from the left, the second carbon has a branch? If I come from the right, it's the third carbon. So I'm going to start numbering from the left. So this would be carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. So that means my methyl is a 2-methyl and my ethyl is a 5-ethyl. Mm -hmm. So I circle it. I circle the non-hydrogen groups. I name what those non-hydrogen groups are. And then I figure out which side I'm numbering from. Last step, if you have more than one that are not the same, list them, list them alphabetically. So this one would be named 5-ethyl-2-methyl-heptane. Hmm? Find the longest carbon chain, name it. Find any non-hydrogen groups hanging off, name them. Figure out how to number, right to left, left to right. List them alphabetically. Now if you have a ring, you can account for all of these. How many total in the ring? Six, so this makes it a what? Hexane. It's a hexane and it's in a ring, so it's called a? cyclohexane. There, you've named all of the ones in the ring. The only one you have to name is the one that's not. So it's a CH2CH3 group hanging off. That would be a... Um, that's an ethyl. Mm -hmm. I have a question. So whenever you're in a ring, you can't, your longest chain would automatically be Yes. Mm -hmm. I could have like a really long chain hanging off and it would always be that ring. That's like the base structure of it, okay? 
So if you have a ring, and like we won't do any more than hard to what anymore than like that kind of thing. Hmm? Ring of six, cyclohexane. And that then accounts for all those carbons in the ring. The only thing you would have to go back and name is the one that's hanging off. So it's an ethyl. So what would I do if I was going to give it a number? One. It'd be one, right? Because putting the one here wouldn't matter if I went clockwise or counterclockwise, but that would actually give it the lowest possible number. It would be on the branch. So it'd be a one, but it's kind of like mono. If there's only one branch and it's a cyclo, they don't usually put the one. You just assume, well, it's just an ethyl, ethyl cyclohexane, which means you can put that ethyl anywhere because I could flip this thing around and around and around. So they would just call it this. I wouldn't mark it wrong if you put a one, but you'll oftentimes see it without, okay? So you'll see like a methyl cyclopentane. So like you were saying, you said that ethyl wasn't an ethyl and that was a, I'm just going to use it that still, so like if that was the E7, it would still automatically be the same. Cycloheptane then? If there were seven carbons in the ring, you always name the cyclo by how many carbons make up the ring. Okay, not how many carbons are in the total molecule, but how many are actually in the ring. So that's why it's a cyclohexane. All right, look at the one over there. So on the far right, they don't have to be straight across. Sometimes you end up with something that's a little more vertical. Longest carbon chain is, mm -hmm. so you see eight. Nope. So eight makes it a octane. Mm -hmm. So that might be one of the things you put on your card. Maybe you want to put your, your carbon chain and numbers. So then this is a, I don't know what those little dashes are. They got marked on there and I can't get them off. <laughs> Pay no attention to them. So that is a methyl. And then over here, this is a ethyl. So I got a methyl, ethyl, ethyl, octane. <laughs> but I got a name. I got to say, which carbon do those hang off of? Do I start from the top or the bottom? So start and keep going in. Which one do you get to a branch first? Does everybody see you get it from the top? The third one down, if you're coming from the bottom, you gotta go four up. So I would start numbering from the top. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So how do I go? Do I go three methyl, five ethyl? Alphabetical. Uh huh. So put the E first before. Mm -hmm. So even though they're not, don't list them numerically. I didn't make the rules. I just teach it. Three methyl. And here's, and like, I'm fine with that. Hope, and your MyLabs Plus has gotten better about not being so uptight about it. But what they would do is, so the IUPAC, the International Union of Physicists and Chemists, they said there should be no space. So if you have commas, you put commas in between numbers, and in between numbers and letters, you put dashes. Except for the last one. So methyl hooks on to octane should be no space. Should be five dash ethyl dash three dash. And I don't do it this way, but you, if you see it, don't let it throw you. If you see dashes, all they're doing is wherever there would be a space, they put a dash so that it shows that that's one word. Like that that's one molecule, so that it then gets separated from a second molecule. So between that but I'm, and methyl, a... there would be a dash here too, yeah. Mm -hmm. But then between methyl and octane, they would put it together. Just like that, ethyl cyclohexane would all be one word. Mm -hmm. But up there, it'd be 5 dash ethyl dash 2 dash methyl <laughs> How long could it change these? Maybe like 20,000? <laughs> Not 20,000, but so like lipids, like fats and oils in your diet, they range anywhere from about 16 carbons to about 24 carbons in length. Yeah, and so you could actually name these really, really long chains of carbon. Why do they stop? Huh? Well, we're just going to do 10, just for simplicity's sake. We're not going to add, but so many of them. <laughs> yes. Yes, and they have made huge, huge molecules of carbon. Huge. Just by linking them together, linking them together. So what we'll talk about... Is this time, yeah? So 5.30. Time goes by so fast in here. <laughs> so there's only one other naming that we have to do, and that is adding 
the simple halogens. So we will talk about fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine next time and add that to our naming process. But they're not a bad one because they only make one bond. So they're going to hang off the chain just like a methyl group, just like an ethyl group, and you go through the same naming process. So we'll talk about these and isomers so that we can do all of that in lab. So you can go through and do your al the alkane, the dynamic study modules for alkanes now. That would probably help. So...